right, I think let's begin. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining this webinar on how to identify and account for the benefits of nature-based solutions for watersheds. My name is Greg Brill. I'm a senior researcher with the Pacific Institute and a senior advisor to the United Nations Global Compact CEO Water Mandate, and I will moderate today's event. This event is the first installment in a three-part interactive webinar series on benefit accounting. The webinar series will be presented by the CEO of Water Mandate, Pacific Institute, the Nature Conservancy, Dunon, and Linotech. Generous support for these webinars has been provided by Ramsar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with everyone who registered for today's event. Next slide, please. Our speakers today also include Carla Muller-Zantop, Advocacy and Transformation Manager at Danone, and Nabia Afuso Amar, Senior Corporate Engagement Advisor for the Nature Conservancy. Thank you both for speaking at today's webinar. I will moderate the session as well as share some of the project details with you. Next slide, please. We'll kick off with a short overview of the project, which informs today's webinar. We will then dive into the practical steps on how to identify the benefits accrued from nature-based solutions, and then show through a practical example across wetlands, a series of indicators and calculation methods that support benefit accounting. There will be discussion during which the speakers will tackle questions from the audience. Please feel free to post any questions you have using the Q&A function throughout the webinar, and we will endeavor to tackle these during the discussion. If we don't get to your question during the discussion session, one of the members of the project team will respond to you after the event. We will then close the event with details of the remaining webinar series and next steps. Next slide, please. So let's start by explaining what NBS are. Nature-based solutions refer to the effective restoration, adaptive management and sustainable use of nature for tackling socioeconomic and environmental challenges. The most commonly accepted definition is presented on the screen from the IUCN. These challenges include issues such as climate change, water security, water, air and soil pollution, food security, economic opportunities, public health and disaster risk management, among many others. Many of these challenges are top of the agenda for governments, NGOs, civil society and businesses around the world. Next slide, please. Nature-based solutions have the potential to deliver sustainable improvements in watershed health with multiple benefits. And these benefits transcend water, carbon, climate resilience, biodiversity in the environment, as well as social, cultural, and economic benefits. However, scaled implementation remains limited due to several challenges and barriers. These are listed on the screen. Although all of these uh, challenges are important, this project specifically aimed to tackle the last point on the list, uh, and that was to address a lack of a standardized approach to identify and account for the benefits accrued from nature-based solution investments. By addressing this challenge, as well as all the others on the list, we help build the business case for investment in NBS. Next slide, please. So it's a brief overview of the project to date. Uh, what we are developing is a standardized method, guide, and tool to account for the stacked water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomic benefits of NBS for watersheds. There are four key outcomes from the project. The first is a landscape assessment, which informed the path of the project. This document was published in August of last year and explores the concept, definitions, and, and classifications of NBS. It reviewed available frameworks and methods for evaluating, measuring, and demonstrating the value of NBS benefits, and also examined the opportunities to, to scale up NBS across different habitats. The method we developed refers to a stepped process which can support the identification of stacked water, carbon, and biodiversity benefits, and identi identify wider socioeconomic benefits of NBS for watersheds. The guide, which we'll speak about today, presents practical guidance on how to use the developed method to identify NBS benefits. This document also provides multiple indicators and calculation methods to account for these NBS benefits. And finally, the tool, which is currently under development, will be a user-friendly online platform which will adopt the developed method and guidance to support benefit identification and accounting. 
So the primary audience of these outputs is expected to be the private sector decision makers, i.e. those involved in implementation and evaluation of NBS interventions. A broader secondary audience includes public sector actors, NGOs, investment organizations, development banks, academia, civil society groups, and local communities. Next slide, please. This webinar, most importantly, also serves as the official launch of the Benefit Accounting of Nature-Based Solutions for Watersheds Guide. The guide prevent, uh, presents the practical steps for benefit identification, indicators and calculation methods to account for NBS benefits, as well as a review of best practices and lessons learned from NBS case studies from around the world. The guide is officially uh, available for download from the link on screen. Please share this resource with colleagues and others in your field as we're confident that this document can support NBS projects both now and in the future. Next slide, please. Within the guide, we present a progression for building the business case for NBS, starting with benefit identification, which can be one of the biggest hurdles for companies, because those looking to make investments in NBS may not necessarily consider or be aware of all the possible benefits that can accrue across NBS projects, let alone know how to estimate or quantify them. Benefit accounting is the quantitative or qualitative estimation or measurement of each of these benefits. Um, when stakeholders undertake these uh, various NBS activities. Identifying an accounting of benefit also enables NBS stakeholders to effectively calculate the output, outcome, and or environmental, social, and economic impact of a project. And the guide provides companies with uh, and interested parties, uh, as well as stakeholders with a method to identify a range of benefits that could accrue across different NBS, and suggested indicators and calculation methods for estimating and measuring these benefits. While benefit identification and accounting are important building blocks to enable actors to assign a monetary value to benefits, i.e. benefit valuation, this guide does not currently provide the resources for this next step. Further stages of the project will certainly consider benefit valuation and we'll report on those in the coming months. Next slide, please. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Carla, who will speak to the guide's benefit identification components. Carla, over to you. Thank you very much, Greg, for this great introduction. So um, as we've heard, we've um, for the benefit identification, we've developed this four-step practical guidance for companies to identify the different benefits of NBS. And the aim was really here to align with existing approaches to address corporate water challenges, um, but also challenges around carbon and biodiversity. So for example, water stewardship efforts or climate change adaptation programs. So that we really um, aim with this NBS guide to feed into the ongoing work of companies and not add an extra burden. Um, and we'll go through the steps one by one during this webinar, but of course we really encourage you to go through the guide. Um, and then depending on the scope that's required by the user or the reader, you can go into more or less detail for each of the steps. So as you can see on this graphic, all the four steps are required during project design phase. And then parts of step three and four also occur during the project implementation phase. And the green arrow here shows you that um, ongoing stakeholder engagement is absolutely crucial for project success um, because we know that the challenges in watersheds cannot be addressed by a single actor or a sim single company in isolation but that we must really come together with different stakeholders and reconcile between the different priorities of everyone to ensure project success. And the yellow arrow shows um, also that uh, data collection should start at the, uh, at the beginning of um, the project design phase and continue throughout until project implementation, because this is absolutely essential to um, analyze the benefits and the improvements to the watershed to then make the case for investments into NBS and really scale them at large. So next slide, please. The first step uh, around identifying societal challenges. So before taking any action in any landscape, it's really, really key to understand the complex local context. Um, so companies, again, should look beyond their factory gates and really consider the broader landscape and then base interventions on the best available science. So we really stress the fact um, that we 
must conduct hydrogeological studies, water risk assessment, um, socioeconomic studies, also build on existing research to ensure that NBS really address the root causes of the challenges in the watershed. Um, and we uh, name the diff different challenges, also building on the landscape assessment that Greg has just mentioned. Um, but we again say that NBS can address multiple challenges simultaneously. Um, and that if required, sometimes companies must prioritize really the most critical ones to tackle during project design. Um, next slide, please. Just to give you an example for the four steps, um, I will run you through a quick example from Danon in Indonesia, um, just to make it a bit more a bit more practical or easier to understand. So um, Aqua, which is done in Indonesia, had conducted various water risk assessment around its production sites and then consequently identified the Rejoso watershed as a priority location for action. So Danan partnered with an Indonesian, but also with a French university to address the hydrogeological conditions, conduct socioeconomic studies. And then through that, I identified various challenges in the upstream, middle stream and downstream. So some of them were, for example, unsustainable farming practices, groundwater drilling downstream, um, also deforestation upstream, as you can see here, and additionally water pressure on the Rejoso watershed from higher increased urbanization. So next slide, please. This brings us on to the st second step, which is identifying available habitat and intervention types. So within the landscape, um, depending on the scale, there can be different habitats. And each of these habitats can address the challenges previously identified with varying degrees of effectiveness. So NBS implementers can really go to this guide to identify the different habitats, and then they will be able to prioritize where to act to yield the most relevant benefits for these uh, water challenges or in general challenges. And it's really important um, not just to consider again the company mandate, but really the all the strategic local interests of conservation organizations, the government and civil society organizations and more um, so that the different actors can align their actions within the ident identified habitats and thereby pool resources and expertise to address multiple challenges at a larger scale to have a higher impact. Um, and then based on the state of the habitat, we have again identified different intervention types that can be considered building also on existing knowledge. And these four intervention types are restoration, management, conservation and creation. And um, a mix of interventions can also be used to improve outcomes. Next slide, please. Again, just to illustrate this with the example of Rejoso Watershed, um, Danone partnered with various additional organizations, so including World Agroforestry and more, and together they identified different clusters within the landscape that had similar biophysical and socioeconomic uh, characteristics, and then identified the different habitats to target, and the main areas were upstream potato farmers, forestry in the midstream and rice production in the downstream. And of course, these, I, these require different types of interventions. In the end, there was a mix of protection and restoration to really improve the ecosystem services in this um, degraded watershed. Um, and again, as I've, as I've said, it was really um, essential to ensure that these interventions were appropriate to all the local stakeholders within the watershed. Hence why we aim to address the different the different farmers, the different uh, people in the area. Next slide, please. So step number three, identifying activities that improve the natural processes. So these interventions, these four broad categories can be broken down into separate NBS activities. So for example, a specific um, NBS activity would be removing alien vegetation in a wetland, for example. And again, uh, I really want to uh, push you to, to look at the guide because we've identified a very, very comprehensive list of activities within this guide. It was a huge amount of work that went into this and it's uh, completely backed by literature and expert advice. Um, and we're really confident that this list is, um, will, it, will address the majority of all NBS projects. Um, and we have identified general categories, but also the relevant 
subcategories and examples so that the readers, again, deciding on, on what they what level granularity of uh, information they need, they can decide for themselves into which level they will they will go. Um, of course, not all, all of these activities are relevant to all landscapes. They're context specific, but um, we encourage you to go through it in detail and then um, you can see which ones are relevant in different habitats. Um, so this can be really helpful during the project design phase just to avoid that companies miss out on any potential opportunities and also help resource allocation, um, budgeting and other operational elements um, while defining these exact habitats. Next slide, please. Here you can see the table <laughs> um, that I just mentioned. So you will have to go to the guide to read it in more detail. Next slide, please. Um, going back to the example, so in the first project phase, the, um, the project team then identified reforestation in the upstream and densification of agroforestry in the midstream based on the steps um, that were done prior. And then in the second phase, there was a reassessment done of the impacts um, of the actions that, that were implemented. And then the team identified that the biggest effect on the watershed was actually um, through regenerative agricultural practices by rice farmers. So they really tackled, they shifted the scope a little bit and are now really tackling downstream rice farmers. Um, and then all these efforts combined, of course, still together with agroforestry, these activities have the potential uh, to impact the chemical and the hydrological structures in the area. Um, which will then go go to result in the multiple benefits, which will be the next step that I will go into. And also one really important um, activity at this stage was that the project team set up uh, a governance, a multi-stakeholder governance to really regulate the local water use for the future. Next slide, please. So identifying benefits and trade-offs the 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 ultimate end game basically um what that we're trying to achieve is um implementing these activities to influence the functioning of ecosystems and thereby improve natural processes and uh, hopefully um, result in multiple benefits for the ecosystem of course there can also be negative effects so trade-offs um these may be unavoidable or are sometimes uh, unintended, unintended, but um, that's just really imp important to also consider. Next slide, please. So we have again uh, created a really comprehensive list of benefits. We have de um, separated them into five broad categories. So water quantity, water quality, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomics. Again, this is really uh, aligned with existing approaches, um, but just a very comprehensive compilation. Um, and we again encourage you to look at the full list because this will help all implementers to understand what can be achieved through investments in the NBS. Um, and also just to make sure that you really consider all the possible impacts to help you justify the business case, but also, as I've just said, um, identify the potential uh, trade-offs. So um, what's also to be noted here is that benefits change over time and space. So during project design, the uh, practitioners of NBS should identify the different scales of benefits that are needed for project success. So that's again, specific on the local context and on the resources available to the project team. Um, and again, stressing the fact essential to keep engaging with stakeholders um, and then really reconciling between the different benefits and trade-offs that can be achieved or that will uh, that will apply to the different stakeholders in the area. So a uh, final example from Rijoso. Next slide, please. So there were different benefits identified for water, carbon um, and environmental and also economic benefits. So for example, these include groundwater recharge, um, carbon sequestration, improved terrestrial habitat quality, um, as well as improved agricultural output. So that's really, um, that's really, that's really the essence of multiple benefits as we mentioned them. 
Um, there were also some trade-offs um, as there are all usually. Um, so within the economic uh, impact category for rice farmers, they had to prioritize uh, improving quality over improving productivity. So even within the different uh, benefit categories, we can we have to understand what might be potential trade-offs and really aim to minimize them through um, different actions. So monitoring, as I've said um, at the very beginning, monitoring and evaluation of project success is absolutely essential over the course of a project. Uh, project. So um, benefits should be estimated or measured to ensure that the project is really leading to the desired outcomes. And that brings us perfectly over to Nabia to speak about calculation methods. Nabia, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Carla, and thank you to Greg for leading us in this webinar as well. So getting into benefit accounting, uh, which is the next step in the NBS journey, I'm just gonna share a little bit about how to go about accounting for those benefits, but also trade-offs. So as we've discussed, NBS benefits in watersheds lead to natural processes, which can lead to outcomes in ecosystems that can be both positive, what we're calling benefits, and negative, what we're calling trade-offs. Across the themes of water quality and quantity, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomics. Generally, the results of NBS projects become visible to project stakeholders in the form of benefits uh, with some trade-offs that may be unavoidable or unintended, as Carla mentioned. Accounting for benefits and trade-offs from NBS is an important step in understanding the impact of NBS initiatives for all beneficiaries across appropriate temporal and spatial scales. You can click through. For each of the themes as shown here for water quantity, section three of the guide presents a detailed table of indicators and calculation methods that can be used to measure different benefits based on existing approaches that have been adopted extensively around the world. There are also details on each of the calculation methods included. The guide also provides general guidance on how to account for trade-offs. A few notes on this. The indicators and calculation methods presented in the guide are general suggestions of possible options for accounting for the benefits of NBD projects. Data availability, the cost of data collection, the context of the project and other factors may influence the indicators and calculation methods that a company or other stakeholder might use to account for benefits. In addition, the selection of the indi indicators really depends on uh, the in what benefits are of interest for stakeholders, including local communities. So please consult the guide for tables of the indicators and calculation methods for each theme. Next slide, please. To illustrate how these tables can be used, I'll review a practical example of how these can be applied to a wetland restoration, protection, or creation project. Ramsar, who sponsored this work, defines wetlands as any land area that is saturated or flooded with water, either seasonally or permanently, natural or man-made. You can see a wetland infographic from Ramsar on this slide. A wetland can be either inland, such as lakes, aquifers, or marshes, or coastal, such as mangroves, estuaries, or coral reefs. The Secretary General of Ramsar says, wetlands provide essential services for nature and people. They provide water for consumption, protect us from floods, store carbon, and other functions critical to achieving sustainable development. These are exactly the types of benefits that corporations and project developers would be interested in accounting for to help build the business case for investment and demonstrate the impact of various activities. I'll now rock through an example of benefit accounting from a wetland for each of the five themes. Next slide, please. So for water quantity, You can see that wetlands function as natural sponges that trap and slowly release surface water and groundwater, as you can see on this diagram. You can click through once. Creating a wetland can contribute to improving surface water storage by storing rainwater through, for example, a retention pond. 
you can click through a few more times. The indicator you would use to account for this benefit is the volume of water captured. You could calculate this indicator using the runoff reduction method by adding more pervious, and by adding more pervious surface, runoff is reduced and additional surface water is captured and stored. This is how you would account for the water quantity benefits of a wetland initiative. Can you click through? Next slide, okay. So for water quality, wetlands provide several ecosystem service benefits such as, which can significantly improve water quality. You can click through twice. In wetlands, water flow slows, so suspended sediment drops out and settles to the wetland floor. Nutrients from manure, sewage systems, and other sources are absorbed by leaf stem growth of plants. Nutrients are also trapped in the soil and used by microorganisms there. Wetlands therefore provide a green alternative to, to traditional wastewater and stormwater treatment infrastructure and are being used extensively for this purpose around the world. You can click through. Creating a wetland is a treatment system with an inlet from a specific facility and an outlet to surface water can therefore contribute to improve surface water quality. The indicator you would use to account for this benefit is the reduced pollutant load. You can calculate this indicator using direct monitoring with monitoring pollutant loads at the inlet and the outlet, or using the modified simple method, which estimates pollutant loading from stormwater runoff from non-agricultural areas. This is how you would account for the water quality benefits of a wetland initiative. Next slide, please. Wetlands are also some of the most effective carbon sinks on the planet, capturing atmospheric carbon in soils for centuries. Wetlands sequester carbon in woody biomass and soil and also uptake carbon through photosynthesis. You can click through four times, please, Joe. Restoring a wetland by planting or restoring native vegetation can therefore lead to improved carbon sequestration. The indicator you would use to account for this benefit is CO2 removals or tons of CO2 equivalent. You could calculate this indicator using stock change or gain loss methods, which are based on information activity data, like the number of hectares of wetland that you restored or emission factors, such as the tons of avoided CO2 equivalent. And this is described by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change publications. This is how you would account for the carbon benefits of a wetland initiative. While wetlands can sequester and uptake carbon, if you click through Joe, you can see that they also release greenhouse gases through respiration and decomposition. This is something that project developers should take into consideration in benefit accounting. Next slide, please. For biodiversity, wetlands provide significant biodiversity and environmental benefits around the world, providing food and natural habitats to thousands of species, including pollinators. You can click through. The native vegetation often found in wetlands can also represent biodiversity in and of itself. Wetlands can also provide connectivity between terrestrial and aquatic habitats. This often makes wetlands high priority or highly threatened landscapes. Restoring or protecting a wetland by planting or maintaining natural vegetation can therefore increase the abundance and diversity of native species. The indicator you would use to account for this benefit is the variety and count of native species. You could also calculate this indicator using the estimated count or number of species based on field counts before and after the project. This is how you would account for the biodiversity benefits of a wetland initiative. Next slide, please. So lastly, for socioeconomics, NBS have measurable social and economic benefits. You can click through three times, please, Joe. These socioeconomic benefits include flood control, products for economic use, and providing aesthetic services and recreational opportunities. You can click through again. Restoring or protecting a wetland by planting or maintaining native vegetation can therefore improve or increase climate adaptation for communities, specifically reducing flooding. The indicator you would use to account for this benefit is the reduction in the number or percentage of climate related hazards or reduced risk of disasters like floods. This would be counted before and after the project, for example. 
and that's how you would account for the socioeconomic benefits of a wetland initiative. You'll notice that specific calculation methods are not included for the socioeconomics theme because benefits really depend on the ability to account for other factors that may influence the outcomes of a project and also the local biophysical, socioeconomic, and cultural context. Many of the socioeconomic benefits can only be realized if there's proactive engagement with local communities and potential beneficiaries. Engagement on socioeconomic benefits should also consider that these benefits are distributed equitably among project stakeholders. Next slide, please. So a little bit on trade-offs. Within all NBS product projects, it is critical that trade-offs are considered during design, implementation, and monitoring phases. So as Carla showed in that slide, considering it throughout the process. There are two types of trade-offs that should be considered. The first is the trade-off between two benefits that are achieved by different project designs, which may not be possible or optimized in the same design. For example, a project that has a higher carbon benefit, but a lower water benefit. Second, there are trade-offs that can arise from adverse impacts of a project or unintended consequences. For example, water quantity impacts from increasing vegetation or unintentionally perpetuating inequities between local communities, vulnerable and excluded groups and landholders. These trade-offs should be mitigated wherever possible. For trade-offs that require balancing different benefits, there may be a project or program design modification that can mitigate this. For example, siting a wetland in a slightly different location to maintain water quality benefits, but better support biodiversity. However, if it is a trade-off with financial, social, or environmental impacts, decision makers will need to consider if and where compromises can be made to ensure that all stakeholders receive benefits appropriate to their needs. Also make sure to ensure that trade-offs do not disproportionately affect some stakeholders more than others. So how do you go about addressing trade-offs? IUCN suggests establishing state safeguards to prevent mutually agreed limits of trade-offs being exceeded or trade-offs destabilizing an entire ecosystem, land or seascape. For example, a safeguard could include ensuring that there is sustainable access to adequate quantities of acceptable water for downstream users if there are large scale environment, uh, agricultural users of water along a particular river upstream. Many related policies such as Red Plus or international organizations like the World Bank have explicit safeguard policies that can be followed. So that's it for me on benefits and trade-offs. We hope that these examples provide some additional information on how to account for benefits in wetlands as a specific example but also show the general promise of nature-based solutions and the value of this guide. If we can better account for the many benefits of NBS and also understand how to mitigate trade-offs across those themes for water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomics, this can make the case for investment much stronger. And if we can also standardize methods to account for these benefits, we can compare across projects and also consider NBS alongside traditional gray alternatives. We look forward to working with companies and other industry stakeholders on this and really encourage you to go and check out the guide uh, today. And we'll be happy to answer any questions as we move into discussion. Back to you, Greg. Thank you both Navia and Carla for the overview uh, and summary that you provided on some of the content in the benefit accounting of nature-based solutions for watersheds guide. Um, I think that was a great overview and at least gave everybody an opportunity to understand some of the work that has been undertaken in this uh, project to date. So it's now time for, for some questions from the audience. I've been monitoring the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, I have suggested some guiding questions on screen, but please feel free to pose your own using that Q&A function. Um, you can raise a question that way and then I'll address it to one of the uh, speakers accordingly. So the first question I have comes from um, Gaia uh, Marini and who asks uh, how the guide addresses issues of social justice around MBS implementation and she uh, will, will they provide some examples there, such as avoid land grabbing and incorporating traditional practices, etc. So ladies, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to jump in here uh, for a few seconds and then, and then if there's anything else you can add, that would be great. Uh, so Guy, what we've done is we have a very uh, 
prominent standout box or pop out box that speaks specifically to stakeholder engagement and the issue of equity and equitability within NBS projects. Uh, as Carla alluded to right at the beginning, stakeholder engagement is one of the key components to making sure that an NBS project is both sustainable um, and equitable throughout uh, the project life cycle. So Carl also mentioned that we need to look outside of the factory fence. Um, and this question feeds very well into that, is that we need to have collective action um, with various corporates, various organizations, but also various local communities uh, and civil society groups as well that speak to these issues of social justice uh, around NBS implementation, but also to ensure that the benefits that are accrued um, are what the, the beneficiaries are needing and what they're wanting, um, and ultimately that they're equitable as well and not necessarily uh, benefiting unfairly from, from trade-offs. Nabia, Carla, is there anything else you'd like to add around social justice? No, I think you covered that well, Greg. There's a lot of information in the guide related to those points on equity. So please make sure to consult those. Great, thank you. Yeah, the one point I specifically want to raise is that one of our panelists, uh, one of our uh, contributors on our expert advisor group uh, really did ask us to look at the issue of social justice specifically within a, uh, through a gender lens as well. So we have quite a large section on social justice uh, stakeholder engagement, gender equity, et cetera, within the guide uh, for practitioners to consider when designing, implementing, and monitoring and evaluating their, their uh, projects as well. The second question I wanted to raise here was from uh, Tian Bastemeyer, who says, does benefit accounting consider to whom benefits apply? An example there is which stakeholders and at what level and for how long? Tim, this is a great question that we grappled with for, for many, many weeks on how best to articulate who the beneficiaries are going to be and the types of benefits accrued. The problem that we face, and I think most NBS projects are going to face as well, is that the local context is going to dictate who the beneficiaries are uh, and the name nature and scale of, of those benefits guide or in report or document um, without taking in the, the local context. So again, we have very specific guidance and guidelines within the guide um, on how to uh, ensure that the stakeholders um, that are benefiting uh, or potentially uh, receiving trade-offs um, are identified throughout the project process. Uh, and as Carla alluded to as well, that changes over time. So as the habitats evolve, um, and certain benefits increase over time. For example, biodiversity uh, will certainly uh, biodiversity uh, values will certainly increase as the habit. Nabia, Carla, anything you'd like to add there? I would just say to look out in the guide for the information related to the various temporal and spatial scales that comes up both in some of the appendices and the general principles for nature-based solutions, but then kind of goes alongside the different steps of benefit identification. So there is information in there, but it's, it's a, as Greg said, it's very context specific and will depend on the various projects that you're, uh, you're looking into implementing. And just to add to that, we also have a section on best practices from different companies. So through various um, uh, interviews that we've conducted and also researching on existing projects. Uh, so we have a full section on that, which is also really um, inspiring for companies. Thanks, everyone. The next uh, couple of questions, in fact, there are three, comes from Preeti Sharma. Uh, and Preeti asks, if a company has embarked on a volumetric water benefit accounting method, so the one presented by the WRI, how will the guide be helpful to identify carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomic benefits? Or do companies need to repeat the exercise to establish baseline for the other areas? Let's start with the first question. Nabia Kolia, uh, Kolia, would you like to tackle that one? Sure, I can, I can give that one a shot. Um, I think through the volumetric water benefit accounting method, we are, 
we have included a lot of the information on water quantity benefits from the VWBA within the guide itself to make sure that there is synergy between those accounting methods. And there's a lot of information that companies that have embarked on that method have gathered about the projects uh, to be able to account for those water quantity benefits. So I would say that, that companies who are using that would have a head start in terms of gathering a lot of information that may be relevant in addition for water quality um, and understanding the, the activities that have been implemented that could be beneficial for uh, biodiversity, socioeconomics, and carbon as well. There are additional uh, indicators and calculation methods that you will need to put in place. And some of those do require um, information from before and after project, for example. So you may need to gather additional data uh, to be able to apply those method methods to some of the other themes. Greg or Carla, would you add anything to that? Um, yes, just to add, uh, as I've said also in the beginning that we really aimed uh, while developing this method to really align with exi existing approaches. So we've tried as best as possible to, of course, avoid any duplication of work. Um, and as Nabia said, it will give you a great uh, start if you have already engaged with the volumetric water benefit accounting. But um, what's really the, the addition of our guide is that we have this very comprehensive list of um, benefits and the quantification methods. So it's really a great compilation that puts everything together in one place. Thanks, Carla. And while you're unmuted, if I can maybe pose the second question from Preeti to you. Uh, Preeti asks, can a non-technical person apply the guide on site or is there a, structure, uh, a structured training or certification program to enable personnel to do so? So that's a great question because, of course, we've really tried to make this as practical as possible and we were risking sometimes of becoming too too much uh, too deep into the academics. Um, so we've really refined the guide a lot of times to make it as practical as possible. And the thing, the step that will make it um, even more applicable to companies, plant directors um, and uh, yeah, local implementer, implementers of NBS will be the tool development. So that will really build on this guide, the method that we've developed for the guide. Um, and we, yeah, we hope to, we're going to start developing that um, now as soon as possible. And um, yeah, the guide is practical, but uh, the tool will be even more practical. And we really hope that the guide is already a great starting point for everyone locally. If you want to Thank add you, to Carla. Nabia, a question for you from Glenn Lowe. In your calculations, oh, let's just scroll down. Let me find it again. There you go. Uh, in your calculations that you just described, do you use underlying hydrological and or ecological scientific models? To really understand trade-offs and benefits at the local level, I would think you would want calibrated or validated models followed up by actual monitoring and verification to quantify those benefits. Great, thank you for the, the question, Glenn. Um, there are, for certain benefits, we are relying on underlying hydrological or scientific models, and those are described in the guide. So there are um, you know, various calculation methods that use uh, assumptions and other data that you might gather to model the benefits that you might, be, that you might see from a certain project. In some cases, we do also recommend direct monitoring if that's possible to either validate the models, um, but that really depends on the project stakeholder and their ability and their resources to be able to put such monitoring in place. Um, we're also going to be gathering additional case studies and piloting the method to gather more information across projects. So I think if there are those out there who are interested in calibrating those models against direct monitoring um, and feeding that back into the process to provide feedback and continue updating the guide, we would love to see that as well to make sure that the models that are presented are, um, are accurate and represent the benefits that are being seen on the ground. Thanks, Nabia. A question from Derek Vollmer says, given the importance of stakeholder Oh, that's just moved again. Give me a sec. Uh, there we go. Given the importance of stakeholder engagement and data collection, is there any guidance on how much of a project budget should be expected to go towards these rather than directly to implementation? 
that's a great question. Let me take an initial bash at this. So Derek, it, it all depends, I suppose, on the scale of the project and the number of stakeholders engaged in the project. So there are going to be projects where it, it might be two neighboring landowners, uh, one being a corporate and one being a farmer. Uh, so the stakeholder engagement budget wouldn't necessarily be as large as something like the Denon example, which potentially had 15 or 20 different stakeholder groups involved. Uh, it also depends on the nature of these engagements, whether they're going to be face-to-face uh, -face or uh, within specific stakeholder engagement workshops, um, if you're going to be developing survey instruments and, and things like that. So it, it's very difficult to apply uh, guidance to this, um, but what we suggest with, with, within um, the steps that we proposed is that just keep your finger on the pulse of the stakeholder needs throughout the project because those might potentially change. As you pull one lever and you start developing uh, different interventions and activities, you might have unforeseen trade-offs that weren't necessarily planned for or prepared, uh, or, or your project has prepared for. Um, and that again, having the, the constant uh, stakeholder engagement opportunities or platforms um, would allow for far more expedient mitigation of those trade-offs. Nabia, Carla, anything to add there? No, you covered it well. Yeah, maybe just uh, just one thing to add around stakeholder engagement. I cannot stress uh, enough the fact of also um, implementing a strong local governance structure. So, of course, you have to engage with stakeholders, but you also have to kind of formalize that participation. And um, so it's really, uh, really essential to have some regular occurring meetings, regular forums, really ensure that people have a voice that, um, yeah, that the different, the different um, priorities are really taken into account. Um, and that was also one of the real, the key success factors, I would say in the Rejoso project that it wasn't done on that was uh, leading all these actions, but they really built the strong local governance that I was um, talking about, and then really empowered um, the local people just, yeah, for their own governance structure and um, reconcile the values between themselves and enable payment for ecosystem services, um, influence local policy, and really, um, yeah, achieve great outcomes through that. Greg, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. There we go. For some reason, things are shifting around on my side. Um, we have another question from Hannah Barry, who says, can you apply these methods of NBS benefit accounting to water and wastewater treatment infrastructure? Nadia, would you like to take a first jab there? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Hannah. We have focused this guide on looking at, um, you know, natural processes and various uh, activities that correspond to, to different habitats as well. Um, so we haven't necessarily thought about how this can apply to gray infrastructure, if that's what you're referring to. So the water and wastewater treatment infrastructure. But for example, the wetland example that I provided, um, which is a form of water and wastewater treatment infrastructure. Um, you can think about doing monitoring there or applying the methods to account for the benefits that you're seeing through those sorts of green infrastructure uh, investments. And the focus is, of the guide is on those kind of nature-based solutions that can contribute to that water and wastewater treatment. Greg or Carla, would you add? Thanks, Navia. What we do try and cover in the guide as well is the complementarity between green and gray infrastructure as well, uh, and how green often nests very, very nicely within, within the gray infrastructure realm. Um, but it all depends how, how wastewater treatment infrastructure is being framed in the question here. So um, the guide does apply methods to both. Uh, for water and wastewater and those um, indicators and calculation methods can be seen in section three of the guide so please do take a look there. Moving on uh, we are running out of time for the Q&A 
Um, but we've got a question from uh, Julian who asks Carla. Uh, Carla, you mentioned about the importance of considering the wider system outside the factory doors. How does the guide encourage the system thinking? Thank you. Um, so what we've said that we've identified different habitats and often when we look at a landscape, we have different types of habitats, um, as I've mentioned, and we've just, um, especially for nature-based solutions that become more and more effective over a large scale, we've really identified, um, as most companies have, that they cannot achieve an impact if they just uh, focus on their factory gates and just purely beyond, beyond uh, next to their operations. So um, I would say that the guy really emphasizes the need for scaling up these, um, these efforts. So through um, helping to build the business case, it will enable companies um, to really broaden, broaden their scope and um, implement activities at a larger scale. And through that, um, we can see that we can um, yeah, blend different types of activities, blend different types of NBS and really um, achieve multiple benefits and um, also attract higher funding amounts, really build the business case um, behind that. So I think the guide is really, really helpful um, to yeah, to encourage encourage the need of implementing various um, and NBS in different habitats within a large landscape, um, and help companies to yeah to to um, influence influence the decision makers in their in their organizations um, to see the huge value that this can have. Thanks, Carla. I think we've got enough time for two or three more questions. So the first uh, asks, did we consider the IUCN global standard and self-assessment tool? Uh, ladies, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll tackle this one. Um, we did consider the, the global standard and within the appendices, uh, we've aligned very closely with this. We've also created um, a specific alignment with how the IUCN global standard aligns with our method and our guide. So please do look within the appendices to see how we have uh, aligned very closely with the global standard, the newly released IUCN global standard, um, to ensure that we are speaking the same language uh, and that we at least align as closely as possible to some of the world leaders on, on NBS. The next question um, comes from Lenneth, who asks, has the guide been conceived specifically for interventions in developing countries or can it also be useful for northern countries? Nabia, maybe I can ask you to tackle that as your last question, and then Carla, I'll find one for you. Thanks, Greg. And yes, the idea with the guide was that it ideally could be uh, implemented in both developing and developed countries. Um, thinking about opportunities for companies, as Carla mentioned, both on-site and outside of the, the gates of a factory in the broader landscape, wherever those companies may, may operate but also for other stakeholders who might be implement, interested in implementing NBS in any locality. Um, we are, as I mentioned, identifying case studies and the landscape assessment that was done for this work looked at case studies from companies um, around the world. Most of those were from um, the Americas and Europe. We're looking to identify additional case studies from Africa and Australia as we move forward and assessed, I, I believe it was 94 case studies that were assessed um, through this, the guide itself. We're also going to be moving, moving into a pilot testing phase with companies. So would encourage um, people who are interested in, in pilot testing this and applying it to projects that are ongoing to bring examples from a range of contexts, um, both from Northern countries as well as developing countries so that we can continue to build um, the case studies, the examples that we have of, of nature-based solutions globally. Thanks, Nabia. Carla, a last question from you, from uh, Natalie Dorflinger. Regarding the tool development, will it be user-friendly uh, and show the content of the guide? Or will it include some calculation components as well? Uh, 
Thank you for that, Natalie. Um, so yes, as I've said, it will be as user friendly as possible. Um, and we're currently um, considering the scope um, of this tool development. So um, if you have, I would say, I mean, uh, Greg, maybe you want to add to this, but also if you have um, some specific additions or where you think this would be most, uh, most helpful for companies, we're also really happy to um, receive any kind of feedback um, so that this can flow into refining our method and really developing this tool so that it is as practical as possible and as helpful as we can make it. Thanks, Carla, that's great. Just to, to quickly add to Carla's response there, the tool will be released at the end of May, and it takes everything that we have in the guide, so all the practical steps around benefit identification, as well as the key indicators and calculation methods, and puts into one needable package that will be an intuitive platform uh, for companies to be able to identify the benefits as well as start quantifying them. We're also in discussions with a number of other organizations around taking much deeper dives into some of the key themes of water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomics, so that we can start um, having a platform to properly measure, uh, to store data, and to have a tool that, that forms far more um, functionality than just an identification and quantification tool. So keep your eye on that. Um, and in the next slide, I'll speak a little more to the upcoming webinars. Uh, so please do diarize uh, and we'll go forward from there. Thank you to everybody for posing questions during the discussion session. Uh, we haven't been able to get to all of them. I have had a quick scroll through most of them. Excellent questions, so thank you for engaging. Uh, the project team will get um, back to everybody that has uh, sent a question. Um, so thank you again for posing those and um, for joining us during the discussion period. Let's go into the next slide, please. The, the last couple of slides as we start wrapping up. So the first, as I've mentioned, this is the first of a three-part webinar series. The second webinar, uh, which will happen in early April, we will be exploring the outcomes from pilot testing the method that we've developed against a number of uh, global NBS case studies across forest and wetland habitats. We're in the thick of things here, and we've been having some really great engagements with a number of corporates that have been investing in NBS globally, as well as the stakeholders outside of those corporate investments to try and make sure that our method is robust and defensible across the, uh, the, the, the NBS. Uh, will be around the launch of the tool and how to use that tool. So this is going to be a crash course in the practical application of the tool that we're developing. Um, so please do join us at the end of May for that. And it's going to show practitioners and other users how to identify and account for the benefits uh, accrued from nature-based solutions using this very practical uh, platform. Again, a big shout out to uh, Ramsar, who is the funder uh, of this webinar series, and we'd like to thank them uh, for their contribution uh, to, to um, publicizing the outputs from our project to date. Can we go to the last slide? Thank you. For anybody wanting to reach out to any of the members of the project team, these are the details across the four organizations that form the project team. So you can see there within the CEO Water Mandate and Pacific Institute, uh, Danone, Limnotech, and the Nature Conservancy. Finally, that is our project page. So for anybody wanting more information on the broader project, uh, as well as the outputs uh, from projects, the landscape assessment and the guide can all be found on the project. Next slide, please. It just um, comes to me to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we've had close on 300 registrants, uh, close on 500 registrants uh, join the, the call um, and it's been an absolute pleasure introducing the guide that we've developed. Uh, over the past year, and we really hope that uh, it, it is as practical and useful an instrument um, as we hope it could be uh, to practitioners um, and those interested in looking to make investments in NPS. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to welcoming you again in April uh, for our second webinar series. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.